service, but we persevered, Hallelujah. and the Lord met with us here. Yes. Oh, what a beautiful altar service, and one night, I don't know if it was last night, I guess it was last night, we sang this chorus toward the end of the service, and it's been on my heart all day long. Thank God He touched me. Thank God He touched me. Nothing like the touch of God. Can we sing it? Oh, He touched me.
tonight. It is a wonderful honor to work with Pastor Paul Thomas and Pastor Gary Thomas and the saints here at Souls Harbor because they love this community. They went to the extra expense. They went to the extra work. I mean, they've got a beautiful building, a facility to have church in. Why in the world would you set up a tent, come out here and have church? Well, let me tell you a little story. 1972, little town, Waynesville, Ohio, is where we're from, and part of Waynesville, we call it the suburb of Waynesville. Waynesville was about 1,500 people, so Corwin was the suburb across the river where my wife and I were actually raised just out of Corwin. She was raised in Corwin. 
A preacher came from Texas and set up a tent. He was related to some of the people there. And they began to have tent revival. When they set that tent up, there was a young couple living there. And the, 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 the father, the dad, the husband of that family said, Is there a circus coming? Are we getting a carnival? And they said, No, we're going to have revival. And he said, Revival? You mean church? And they said, yeah. And he said, well, that's stupid. There's a church right there. And it wasn't, it wasn't too much farther than from his front door to that church than the church right there, maybe another 100 feet or so from the house to the church. There's a, there's a church right there. But what was so crazy was he never went in that church. They set that tent up and he loved music so he would open his front door, turn out the living room lights so nobody could see him listening. He'd listen to the singing and the worship. After a night or two, he went out and sat on the front porch in the dark with a porch light off. Then they made it over in their lawn chairs and sat over on the railroad track between them and the tent. Finally, they got in their car, went around and drove around into the parking lot of the church and sat there and listened. Got out of the car and sat on the fender and listened. Then someone came and asked them if they'd like to pray. They went under that old gospel tent and that young man and young lady got saved. Amen. Gloriously saved. It changed their lives. They're still saved today. Changed their lives. And they had a four-year-old little girl and it changed her life. The whole direction of her life was changed because of that tent revival. Because someone cared enough to go outside the four walls of the church. And that little girl sitting right here at this piano my, my dear wife, it not only changed her life, but it changed my life. Are y'all with me here? That's why I think it's worth going outside the walls because somebody's life is going to be changed Amen. right here tonight. By the touch of God, this church is willing to go to that effort because they feel like you are worth it. And I do too. As I said, it's such a privilege to work with them. And I want this community to know there are men that love you. There's a church that stands ready to be a family to you right here. Right here at the end of 4th Street, there's a church that cares about people. And that's important nowadays. In fact, it's super important nowadays. And I'm thrilled to be working with them. I want Brother Gary Thomas to come and take this service and Obey the Lord. We're going to sing. Worship the Lord. Let's just have church tonight. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing. Amen. Uh, I thought about this a couple of times. Uh, we've had two services now. You guys are in a part of the third. And uh, last night, as Brother Boggs told us, we... Uh, we were debating on whether or not to have it because uh, it, uh, the weather showed that it, that the uh, rain was going to continue and storms was just going to settle right over us till about nine o'clock. And uh, there was some lightning and things going on. And he said, uh, being in a tent where all these metal poles were with lightning was not a good combination. Uh, but he said, uh, he said, let's call Brother Thomas. And I said, well, I can tell you what Brother Thomas is going to say. <laughs> Brother Thomas is going to say, let's have church. Amen. And we had church. And um, it was so good that there were some saints here. Because as we were preparing to have church, Sister Jeanette called. And she was crying and in quite a panic. And said, Jeremiah... They just found him and he's not breathing. He's breathing now, but he wasn't breathing and they rushed him. They're rushing him to the hospital. I don't know anything. Would y'all please pray? And uh, we cried out to God. Amen. We stopped everything that was going on. And we just lifted Brother Jeremiah up before the Lord and we cried out to God. And he's in church tonight. Hallelujah. We learned afterwards, we went, uh, went up and Sister Jeanette said that he had actually died. And uh, he had flatlined and he was, he was gone. But um, Thank 
God have mercy. Amen. And I told Brother Jeremiah, I said, you're walking a thin line on the edge of eternity. But you know the reality of it is, folks, we're all walking a thin line on the edge of eternity. And that's why we do this. Because God made a way where we can step into eternity yes. with confidence yes. and knowing that our destiny is not a devil's hell, yes. but there's hope in Jesus. Can you say amen? Yes. Amen. There's hope in Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. And I'm sure tonight if we had opportunity, if we gave opportunity for someone to testify, you could all testify to what the good Lord has done. Preacher friend of mine, about 30 years ago, we put up a little tent here and had an old-fashioned Sunday. Brother Brown, he was a black uh, black preacher, pastor, friend of mine. He always teased everybody that we were brothers. I loved him dearly. He taught me an old song. I guess they used to sing in black churches, and it just went like this. He said, "I got just what I wanted. I got just what I wanted." I got just what I wanted from my Lord. Well, I got just what I wanted. Oh, I got just what I wanted. I got just what I wanted from my Lord. Well, a healing was what I wanted. A healing was what I wanted. A healing was what I wanted. Just what I wanted from my Lord. Well, salvation was what I wanted. Salvation was what I wanted. Salvation was what I wanted from my Lord. Well, salvation was what I wanted. Salvation was what I wanted. And I got just what I wanted from my From my Lord, the Holy Ghost was what I wanted. The Holy Ghost was what I wanted, and I got just what I wanted from my Lord. Did you get it? Well, I got just what I wanted. I got just what I wanted. Oh, I got just what I wanted. leading, it'll be all right. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. Well, I, I just want to sing that old song because you guys that weren't here last night, I'm telling you, you missed a message. Brother Bob's preached to us, if it hadn't been for the Lord, seven times he testified of what happened. It hadn't, if it hadn't been for the Lord. And then he said, our help is in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Can somebody tonight think of where you would be tonight if it hadn't been for the Lord? Can you think of that night when you should have died in that car wreck, but the Lord came by? Hallelujah. Amen. I didn't know this until I was a grown man, but my dad told us a story about five years ago in church. Maybe it's a little longer than that. I don't know. But he was in the Navy as a young man. He was taking the trash out one night. He was on the bow of the ship. And a wave came over and literally knocked him off his feet. And there was just two runs around the ship of metal. And he lost, he lost his footing and he just reached out and grabbed one of those wires. And he wasn't right with God at that moment. I wouldn't have been born. He would have never met my mom. That changed a lot of things. 
But most importantly, it changed someone's destiny. And I want to tell you tonight, friend, God is willing to go to great, great lengths to see that you have an opportunity to make heaven your home. Amen. And so I want to encourage you tonight, get in with the preacher. Let God touch your heart. Let God do a work in you tonight. It would be a waste to go through all of this if the Lord didn't touch us. But oh, praise God, He's willing to touch us. Amen. Amen. I just want to say I love Brother David and Sister Boggs and Sister Odie. Thank you all for your burden. Thank you for being willing to come to Souls Harbor Church and set up your tent. Y'all are such a blessing to us. We love you dearly. Thank God for your friendship. And uh, I just want to take just a moment to introduce Brother, our pastor, Pastor Paul Thomas, and he's going to come and receive the offering. I think Stephen Lisa is going to sing for the offertory. But if you would, this is my dad, Pastor Thomas. And I just want to say one thing before he comes. This is... Uh, obviously, Brother Box said it. We would love for you to come and let us love you and be a, be a part of the family of God here. But if you go to another church, we're not trying to take you out of your church. We just want to be a blessing to the family of God. So get everybody you know to come. Amen. We're going to preach the gospel. We're going to believe God will touch people. And that's all that this is about. That's it in a nutshell. Amen. Brother Thomas, would you come and, and greet the folks and receive the offering tonight? Boy, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Some of you I may not have met, but uh, some of you I may have met and forgot. <laughs> when you get old, uh, the, the thing that I'm worried about losing the most is my memory. But uh, we want to say we're glad you're here. And most of all, we're glad for the Spirit of God. To be here. Amen. Uh, we want to say you're welcome. And uh, uh, we want all, all the churches in town, we'd love for them to come be to where we can bless them and where they would grow and the, the Lord can just have His way because God wants to do great things. He really does. He, he wants to show Himself strong through the lives of His people. And uh, I just praise the Lord for what God is doing. And tonight, I believe the Lord's got a miracle for every one of us. I really do. I believe He's got something special for us in this service. I love to have a fresh feeling of the Spirit of God. Amen. Amen. I, I love to be where I'm submerged in the Holy Ghost again. Well, let me just share just quickly here that you don't need, I know you don't need just a bunch of folks preaching, but uh, let me share something that might be a help to you. We're made up of three parts. Uh, we're made up of spirit, body, and soul. That's what the Bible tells us that we're made up of. And uh, how many of y'all have made some big mistakes in your life? Yeah. Now I'm talking about you made some big mistakes. Yeah. You've done things wrong. <laughs> what it is, your spirit is what leads you to make mistakes. Your spirit is what guides you in whether you make right choices or bad choices. That's the reason Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, you've got to be born again. Now, he wasn't talking about the bodies going to be born again. That's what Nicodemus took it that he's talking about. And he said, do you enter into your mother's womb the second time to be born? Jesus said, no, that's not it. He said, you've got to be born of water and of the Spirit. So he was talking about your spirit has got to be born again. When your spirit gets born again, you start making right choices. Boy, isn't that wonderful? Yes. When you ask the Lord to forgive you and come into your life and you get born again, oh, there's a guide there that starts guiding you in the right direction. Amen. Now the soul, the Bible tells us that the soul is converted by the Word of God. So as you start studying and reading the Word of God, then you get a direction that changes the course of your life. You start making better choices. Life goes to change it. And uh, of course, we know the body, that's just what we're living in until the time that we get out of here. And uh, boy, us older folks, we really know that uh, he's pinching a little harder. You know, saying it's just about time for you to go. Amen. But I just tell you tonight, God has got something special for every one of us. If you'll just let your faith loose. If you'll just say, I'm going to believe, 
I'm going to start believing right now for God to do what He wants to do in my life. Well, I tell you, before you leave from here, you're going to say, Boy, it was good being in the house of the Lord. Because He's got something special for every one of us. Now, I'm going to receive the offer tonight and give you all the truth to the hill. Uh, this tent, these chairs, and these altars are not, they don't belong to the box. <laughs> but uh, all the rest of this stuff belongs to him, and He's had to pay for it. Where you can give tonight the way that you'd like to, and you want to wait until uh, the weekend or tomorrow or whatever. But uh, I'm going to give $300 in, in uh, this revival to help support them and keep them on the road. And I just ask if any is good to join me. And if you're not to where you can, whatever you can give. Uh, the Bible teaches it's, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. just tell you that He'll bless you as you learn to trust Him. Ooh, man, I feel so. Come here. I'm going to run this tent myself. And that, that's going to be tough on the guy that's almost 80 years old. But I feel the Spirit of the Lord in saying that, that he, he wants to bless us. He said, I would that you prosper and be in hell even as your soul. So God's plan for His people is for us to have a better life than what we're having. I mean, He wants you to enjoy this life and then have heaven when you get there. Boy, what a deal. Amen. Amen. Well, we can have some ushers to come and help us. Amen. I picked three out of four servants. You going to come here, Bryce? Just to buy 
and his mercy and I'm thankful that we can trust our God you know the God that we serve is the creator of this universe and this beautiful state that we have the privilege to be in tonight our God created that but yet he took time to care about you and I and you know there's a lot of people here on this earth that are good at what they do and my dad as a little girl I thought my dad could fix anything well there come a point where I had to learn I don't remember the exact time but I learned dad can't fix everything so if dad can't fix it, I take it to my grandpa. And if grandpa can't fix it, it's badly broken. But you know what? There come a day when my grandpa even learned that God was the one you took everything to. And he didn't get saved until I was 19 years old. But now sometimes if I'm struggling with something, he'll say, baby, you got to pray about it. And it don't matter what we face in this life. God is concerned about you and I. I don't know your name. You may not you don't know everything that I have need of, and I don't know your needs. But I can point you to the one that I believed in. And there's power to move in, a, in our needs and our situation. And he's concerned about you and I tonight. And I'm so thankful that I can trust in him. He counts the stars one and all. He knows how much sand is on the 
depths of my despair, I prayed for mercy. I heard his words, the price was paid on the cross for you that day. Take my hand now, child, and welcome to text is out of the book of Hosea, the prophet of God, and God sent Hosea to find a wife. God did not send Hosea down to the church, didn't send him down to the good side of town. God said, Hosea, I'm going to teach the lesson, I'm going to teach a lesson to the children of Israel, and I'm going to do it through your life. I'm going to demonstrate for them what real love is. I want you to go marry a woman of the harlots. I want you to marry a woman from the bad side of town. Bad raising, no hope, no way of ever doing better. Because that's the way people are when I love them. So, Hosea goes down and he brings Gomer back for his wife. You see, I, I love this story in that number one, God knew the character of Hosea. That Hosea would love, would, would obey him because he loved him. He knew Hosea's character. Now, I, I listened to a message quite a while ago. I was going down the road looking for things to listen, and, listen to. And a preacher preaching on Hosea. I thought, well, I want, I want to hear that. I love preaching about Hosea. So I, I loaded it up on my phone. I'm going down the road and listen. He, he probably preached 15 or 20 minutes about the arguments that Hosea could have given God on why he shouldn't go down and pick a wife out of the harlots. I mean, number one, what's the church going to think? I mean, look what I'm moving into the parsonage here. What's the church going to think? Number two, what's the community going to think? Number three, that's not the kind of woman I wanted anyway. And he really preached several minutes about those 
objections Hosea could have had. But here's what I love. Hosea made no objections. As far as we read, God said it and Hosea did it. God understood the character of Hosea that he would obey him no matter what he said. Oh, I would to God that I could live such a life before God that God would be confident that if he spoke to me, I would obey him. Friends, I'm not there yet. I struggle sometimes. I struggle with reality that God is in control and not me. How about that? Go ahead. Got any, got any amens that you want to direct back to yourself on that and not just to me? <laughs> I struggle with the fact that God is in control and I don't get to be in control. But I want to have the character of Hosea. And if God said it, I'll do it if I have to break my neck doing it. God speaks this word to Hosea that I know there's no way he understands this. Go take a wife of the harlots, Hosea. There's no way he understands that. But God knew his character and he did it. He brings Gomer home. It looks for all intents and purposes like they have a happy home. They begin to have children. You know, the reality is she's probably never lived this good. Probably the way things were in that day, she lived that life because that was the life that her mother lived. And maybe her grandmother and her aunts and her cousins. It was a way of life for her. It was a life of abuse. It was a life of hate. A life of anger. A life of hurt. And here she has a man that loves her just like she is. That had to, that had to affect her. She's, she's, she's moved into a house that, that is now a home. And there's a man that cherishes her. Not just uses her, but cherishes her. Like God cherishes people. That had to have a positive effect on her life. And I see a happy husband and wife. The man of God and his wife. And children are added to this marriage. They bring that first child into their home and that child is regarded as the gift of God. And, and you see the happiness flowing through their marriage. And then a second child is added. And each one of these children are given a name which is very important to the story. But really the one I want you to see is the third child. And his name given to him means not my child. And of course, God speaking to the children of Israel, you are no longer my children, you have rebelled against me. But possibly, possibly the implication that Hosea recognizes his happy home is not happy anymore. And perhaps this third child is not even my child. Now, I don't mean to falsely accuse Hosea or Gomer. Not at all. But not long after that third child is born, she leaves the home and goes back into the life where she came from. I want you to see not only does God understand Hosea's character, He understands Gomer's character. And that is the character of us. It is our predisposed willingness to go back into sin. It is our it is our terrible, terrible habit of being washed from sin and going back into sin. God knows the character of man. 
That's our natural inclination to go back into living for the flesh. That's what we're made of. Flesh. That, I love that illustration that our pastor gave us about the body and the soul and the spirit. And that body, that old flesh, it fights against us and pulls us back until it wears our spirit down and we choose to slide back into those old lifestyles. God knows that unless a true conversion takes place in Gomer's heart, all the good things that she's got, the fine dresses, the home she's got to live in, a husband that cherishes her, smiling children that love her, all of those will not keep her if she doesn't have a change in her heart. Listen, that is humanity right there in a nutshell. Without a lasting change in our heart, we cannot stay with the good things that God has given us. How can Gomer leave that home? How can she leave that man that loves her? How can she leave her children? How can she leave the good things that she has? It's because her heart has not been changed. Peter in the Bible gives us a very, very crude description of this. He said it's like a hog, a sow that has been washed, going back to wallow in the mire. You clean that hog up, wash him, wash her. I mean, you can brush her teeth and paint her toenails. I've seen people dress their pigs up. They got little bows on the end of their little square, squiggly tail on the end. But you give that hog a moment, a chance, he's going right back to his familiar territory. A mud puddle is what he loves more than anything in this world. Are y'all with me? Peter said, we that turn back are like a sow going back to the wallowing in the mire and... Then it gets even more descriptive. Like a dog going back to its vomit. Now, I don't want to turn your stomach, but that's in the Bible. And, and the reason it turns our stomach is because it is so despicably gross. A dog that gets sick and goes back and licks up its vomit. Do, do you have to describe it, Brother David? You want me to do it again? The reason I'm describing it is because that is our character. God washes us and cleanses us and brings us into His family. And the first chance we get, if we're not careful, we're right back out there in the mire. We're right back out there as grossly as a dog eating its own vomit. That is the character of man. Yes. Yes, yes. Oh, I wish it were not so. I wish I could tell you that the Bible is wrong in that respect. I wish I could tell you that Hosea's story is a fairy tale and Peter's description went way overboard. But 51 years of living, I see it over and over and over and over. I see it in my own self if I'm not careful. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it in my family. I've seen it in my friends. I've seen it in church after church after church across this nation and around the world. If we don't keep the expenditure, our character is to go back. Oh God. Gomer goes back. And like most of us, Gomer probably only goes back a step or two. And that's all I'm going. But before she knows it, she's a step or two farther. That's all I'm going. That's it. But before I know it, Going a step or two farther. 
Brother Lyndall Birdsong pastors an outreach church in Moore, Oklahoma. Brother Lyndall has had a burden for those who are down and out and needing some extra compassion. All of his ministry, he resigned a very, very good church and started this outreach church. Just a church just mainly to reach to homeless and drug addicts and people who don't feel comfortable going to churches. I was there and preached for Brother Lindo a few Sunday mornings ago. Man, I'll tell you, I love seeing them people come to the altar and get saved. Brother Lindo told me a story. He said, Brother Davey, let me, let me tell you about a man that I preach to every week in one of the prisons here in Oklahoma. This man, after Brother Lindo had been there several times, said, Pastor, can I, can I tell you my story? Brother Lindo said, Sure. He said, I was, in, I was in Bible school many years ago and told him a very familiar Bible school. He said, I was living a double life. I was called to preach. I was professing Christianity. But I was living a double life and nobody but one other person knew I was living that double life and that person was back in my home state. He said, I'm just happily playing a hypocrite. Not really calling myself a hypocrite. Not even thinking of myself as a hypocrite. But that's really what I was. He said an elder teacher called me in and said, Son, I need to talk to you about what God has showed me. God has showed me you're living a double life. And here's what you're doing. And much to that young man's shock, it was right on the money. Nobody knew it. But God revealed it to that preacher. I mean, just spelled it out. It was a very wicked, deep sin that only one other person knew about. And that preacher knew it because God told him. He said, son, I want to help you. He said, I want, I want to help you get right. We'll work with you here. He said, you, you, got, you got to get this right. You got to, this, is your, this is your chance. And he said, listen, there's something else the Lord showed me. Now, I told you what the Lord has shown me, so you know I'm telling you the truth. And the Lord has also shown me there is a cliff up ahead of you. And if you don't turn around in just a few days, you're going off that cliff. The young man said, I left that office angry. I quit Bible school and I went home. Within days, within days, he was in a situation where his iniquity was revealed and as a result of that revelation there were hateful and angry words and he murdered two people and 30 some years later he's still in prison you think you're only going so far but Gomer is living proof and that young man in Bible school is living proof you don't determine how far you're going when you leave home Somebody pray for me here. Saints, will you pray for me? I'm preaching to somebody under this tent. I'm preaching to somebody beyond this tent. You may say, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm tired of being under those rules and regulations. I want to be my own man. I want to live my own way. And I'll only go so far and no farther. But you will not stop until you're on the auction block. That's exactly where Gomer was. She was a slave to her sin. You can't control sin. Sin? Somebody, somebody give me a witness here. You can't control sin. Sin is like a fire. Once you bring it into your bosom, that fire cannot be put out. It is only satisfied by more fire. The more it consumes of us, the more satisfied it is. Oh, I wish I could preach to somebody here. Gomer is an illustration of, of our own nature, our own character. She ends up at the bottom a slave to her sin. Somebody gets the word to Hosea. Gomer's going on the auction block. And Hosea doesn't demonstrate the character of a man because most of us would say what she deserves. Y'all with me here? Go ahead. I could have told her that. 
I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry that you turned down our love and our advice and you've ended up on the auction block, but I told you so. Hosea doesn't demonstrate our character. He demonstrates God's character. Hallelujah. I said He demonstrates the nature of God. And He finds His way down to that auction block with all the money that He can carry in His hand. Probably cleaned out every place He had where He had money. And He goes down there and He bids the price until He wins the auction. Now, now He has. He owns her. She's not only a wife, she's property. He has the, he has the right to kill her if he will, to put himself out of misery, to punish her for her waywardness and the way that she hurt him and hurt his children because sin always hurts your family. I said sin always hurts your family. And he could have provided vengeance on her, but he does not provide vengeance on her. He says, I've come to take you home. I'm not going to kill you. I'm not going to curse you. I'm going to care for you. You, praise God. I'm not going to kill you. I'm not going to curse you. I'm going to care for you. I've come to take you home. I'm preaching to somebody here tonight that God has come to take you home. I said God has come to take you home. Put you right back in the house. Right back in her place as wife and mother, demonstrating the character and the nature of our God. Oh, hallelujah. We went away over and over and over again. But on this Friday night of Tim Revival, I felt like before I ever stepped out of the motor home that God was going to speak to somebody and say here tonight, I've come to take you home. I know that you've done wrong. I know that you've done wrong. But I'm going to leave the past behind. I said I'm going to leave the past behind. And I'm going to allow love to conquer one more time. I've come to take you home. Brother David, what do you know about that? I know I see it week after week after week. That's one thing. I see God doing it. I watch Him do it. But I don't only watch Him do it. I experienced Him doing it in my own life. And I can say with every other Christian here, what He's done for me, He'll do for you. Hallelujah! Oh, hallelujah! What He's done for me, He will do for you. I was preaching under this tent in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Large crowd there that night. I wasn't even to the second point in my message. And here come a man up the aisle. His beard was kind of matted. His hair was kind of greasy. Didn't smell the best. In fact, I smelled him before he got all the way up to me. Now, I don't say that to belittle him. I say that to describe the position that sin had put him in. I'm preaching right here. And he comes and stands right before me. I said, Preacher, no sense in going any farther. You've already described me. I want to get saved. Praise God. Amen. You've already named me. I want get, and I want to tell you, God saved him right there. I said, God saved him right there. He was such a mess and so different than the man he had been. He was 60-some years old. There were, there were relatives of his, close relatives, that were in that service that did not even know him. And he did not even know them, but they were very close relatives that's the change that sin had brought to him but he got up out of that altar a saved man because God is welcoming home everyone who will come I've come to take you home you've heard the story possibly of the young man who quarreled with his father 
And his father said, I'm not going to allow you to do that, son. You're not going to strike me and your mother. You must leave. You must leave. So the young man struck out on his own. Soon he was engulfed in sin. Lost in a terrible, terrible, pitiful shape of sin. Some way, and I don't remember how it went, he got the notion to go home again. After many years, and he wrote to his mom and dad, said, Mom and dad, I'm going to come home. I'm going to take the train in that comes by the house. I'll take it all the way to town and walk back. And I won't even bother to get off the train unless you give me a signal that I'm welcome back home. I'm sorry for what I've done, but I know you've banished me and I won't come if you don't allow it. But if, if you would allow it, would you tie a white rag in the old tree there next to the railroad track? And he didn't hear anything back. He got on the train. As he got close, he began to tell a fellow passenger about the letter that he'd sent home. He said, I, I can't even bear to look out the window. But the man looked out the window for him. And there's a white rag on every branch of that tree. You remember that old story? I don't know the validity of it, but man, it demonstrates what I'm telling you. That's God. I said, that's God. There's a white branch on every limb of the tree. Come on back. Come on. You're welcome. You're welcome. Would you bow your head with me here? <laughs> I've stood in that same place Bound by sin Broken slain From the depths of my despair I pray for mercy I heard His words Christ was put on the cross for you that day. Take my hand now, child, and welcome. Welcome home.
you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. There's so much power in the blood. Oh, would you offer evil victory when there's wonderful power? She's got bad knees. 
knees bent back. She danced all over that place. And that wasn't the only night. The last night of revival, she danced all over that place again. Oh, yeah. That same power is present right here.
listen to me just a moment. We are all mere men, right? None of us have superpowers. Alright? I hate to destroy your belief in fairy tales, but nobody has superpowers walking around in shoe leather. Right? No cartoon character. No movie star. No preacher has superpowers. The only thing we have is access to God's superpower. Right? But we have dared to have the boldness to ask God to do miracles. Haven't we? I mean, that's pretty bold for us as men to ask God to do miracles. But He commanded us to ask. So if we have the boldness to ask, then I think we should have the boldness to give Him glory. Amen. Give Him praise for what you've seen Him do. And give Him praise for what you have not yet seen Him do. Come on, give Him glory. I believe we ought to have boldness to praise Him.
I sung earlier with just a little more feeling right now. He touched me. How about it? saints here. We want to come alongside you and be a help to you if we can. Because we're all in this together. Right? There are no spiritual Lone Rangers. You hear me? Besides, a Lone Ranger had Tonto. Everybody needs somebody. We need each other. So let us know. We want to help you. If you got a visitor's card tonight, keep the track and the, the information about salvation. Keep the pen. You can fill out some information, whatever you feel comfortable filling out. Give it to one of the guys at the back. We want to keep in touch with you. I just, I just checked right there, Brother Thomas. I started to go on from, from we need each other, but I need to go back there. I was in a church many, many miles from here many years ago. I was preaching. I have no idea what the subject was. And I took a just a tangent in my preaching, it seemed, completely away from what I was preaching about how badly we need one another and we need a good home church. And, and I love what the pastor said tonight. If you have a home church, we're not trying to steal you. I'm thrilled you're here. That, that's awesome. The churches would come together to worship. That's, that's real Christianity, right? If you're not attached to a church, you need to be in a good, Bible-believing, godly-living church. I took a 10 or 15 minute tangent on that in the middle of my message and went back to my message and thought, what in the world was that about? 
on the way home that night the pastor said you see the older man and woman in the back yes very nice I, I spoke to him he said we have known them for years but they will not attend faithfully because they don't need a home church he said I could not believe you opened their mail and read it <laughs> He said, they are not going to believe I didn't tell you. I said, if they need proof, have them, have them ask me. You know where they were the next night? In church. You know where they were every midweek and every Sunday they were physically able until he passed away? Right there in that church. They just needed to hear somebody new say it. I just felt they check in my spirit, right? When I told you a moment ago, listen, we need one another. I need you. You hear me? I need the family of God. I have a home church in Ohio. I don't get to attend very often. We're on the road all the time. But don't think I don't have a pastor. My pastor will jerk my chain in a heartbeat if he just takes a notion that I need it. And I thank God for that. Not only that, but I'm submissive to these men. If they see something in my life, something I need to do differently, I will endeavor to do it because I want to go to heaven. What you need to do is attach yourself to a godly man, a godly church, and say, show me how to get to heaven. I'm raring to go. Praise God. Well, that was free. It didn't cost you any extra. Just a couple of minutes of your time. And I love what we're feeling here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. When you guys come on before I, before I preach again. Well, it's getting gooder and gooder, isn't it? Amen. Well, I think we're going to have to sit out some more chairs tomorrow night. How about you? But i got good news for you. He's got a whole bunch of them in that trailer. <laughs> so invite some folks. Go and be blessed. And come back tomorrow night ready to worship the Lord. Can anybody say with me? Amen. I got just what I wanted. I got just what I wanted. service long but you know you're made overcomers by, by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony yes. for a long time I've been I've been running I was one of those Bible school students that turned their back on God you know, I let bitterness you know I let hurts you know dictate how I was going to live my life instead of trusting on God. But, uh, you know, um, last night, I, you know, it had been a while, but I decided I was going to buy a, uh, buy painkillers. And, I took one, took it. And barely was laced with something. I overdosed. The next thing I know, you know, I, you know, I went, I went out. I guess. And next thing I know, I'm 
waking up to, you know, paramedics and everybody around me. And, uh, you know, they were able to revive me and everything, you know. That's why I'm hurting so bad today. My chest is, you know, from them doing the compressions. Well, when I was at the hospital, one of the police officers that, that showed up, yeah. he, um, he uh, asked his sergeant if it was okay if he showed me the video from his body cam. I saw my own dead body right there. Right there. I, I don't deserve to be here right now. I should be burning in hell right now. I don't deserve this. But for a long time lately, I've been praying, God, if my life is worth anything, show me. Because I have even been praying for death. I, you know, I've been in such a big depression lately. I've been praying for death. I just, God, you know, then I, God, show me something. I can't pray. And that's dangerous, though, you know, because he showed me something. And, and um, you know, I was a lucky one because I got a second chance. Remember this. If you're out there and you're struggling with something right now, you know, God doesn't always give you that second chance. Right. You know, I've seen Kevin on the on the pews in this church. Yeah. He didn't get the second chance. Right. You know, I saw my best friend Josh laying in a casket after he got shot in the head. He didn't get a second chance. I don't know why I did, but praise God, you know, I don't want to risk it anymore. I don't want to risk it anymore. I don't, I don't want a third chance. I want to live for God from now on. And so please, if you're struggling with something... Yeah. There's only one way to go, you know, and it's right here. These altars right here, that's where you're going to find your way. Well, we've been praying for a long, long time for things to start happening. I believe they are. Go and be blessed. Be back tomorrow night. We love you all. Get somebody to bring them with you. Hallelujah. Oh yes, we are having services on Sunday morning and Sunday night as well. So everyone be here in the tent. We're having services in the tent. God bless you. You're dismissed.